Thank you. Clerk Seegers, can you please take roll? Borninski. Good evening. Um, I'm here in the boardroom. Foster. Good evening. I'm at my home in Canton Township. Anguli. Good evening. I'm at my home in Canton Township. Graham Hudak. Good evening. I'm here in Canton Township. Let the record reflect that Clerk Segrist is in attendance. He is in Livonia, Michigan, in Wayne County. Slavens. Good evening from Canton Township. Ann Snyderman. Good evening. I am here in Canton Township. Thank you. Can I have a motion, please, to adopt the agenda? So moved. Support. Motion moved by Clerk Segrist and supported by Treasurer Slavens. All in, oh, Clerk Segrist, please take roll call. Warninski. Aye. Foster. Aye. Anguli. Aye. Graham Hudek. Aye. Segrist, aye. Slavens. Aye. Ann Snyderman. Aye. Thank you. The first item on the agenda, first and only item, is the study session, um, 2022 and 2023 budget, budget presentation. So I will pass the baton on to Director Wendy Trumbull, and she will lead us through the budget. All right. Uh, I think I can actually share. All right, um, thanks you guys. Um, it's that fun time of year where we get to talk about the budget. Um, let's see if I can get this going the right way. All right, there you go. Okay, um, so we're gonna do a similar budget format presentation that we've done in the previous years. To those of you who have been here, it'll be kind of the same old, same old. Um, but as you recall back March 2nd, we actually talked about the 2022 budget with all the trustees. Uh, we, went back, we went through that in very much detail. All the departments went through their 2022 budget. So right now, the focus of today is going to be to just go through the changes of the 2022 budget, what is different than what we talked about back in March. We're not going to rehash everything that we went over in March. Uh, we're just going to talk about the changes. Uh, once we get through those changes, I'm going to give a brief um, overview of what the assumptions were used in creating the 2023 budget. Uh, and then I'm going to turn it over to the departments to go through their uh, specific items. Uh, all of the departments then will circle back around at the end and I'll do an overview summary of the overall um, 2023 budget. So with that, um, I have this presentation in front of you uh, as well. Some of the information was sent out to you guys over the weekend or actually Thursday or Friday to the trustees. We're not going over that in detail. We have summaries that we're going to go through instead of you know, 200 pages worth of a budget document. Um, so uh, the one thing we didn't talk about with this presentation for the 2023 budget is including is really the same items, assuming the similar levels of service and the similar um, programs that we've had in the past. In the upcoming few weeks, we're gonna be having some additional study sessions to talk about some of the board goals and figure out where the priorities of those are. Uh, to work those into a budget adjustment to bring forward to the board in January. So we're going to actually talk about incorporating the rest of those goals into in January. So we haven't forgotten about those. They're just uh, going to be forthcoming. Just as an overview reminder for the 2022 budget, the property taxes are based on the value at December 31st of 2020. Uh, the inflation that the state allows us to um, incorporate into those, into the taxes is 1.4% for that year. And the tax growth on the new properties is about 2.3%. We know what that actually was, but that we know it's 2.3%. It isn't an estimated at this point in time. State shared revenue is based on the state's estimation. That's about a 2% inflation. And then the other revenues are based on the prior year's revenues and estimations of the future permits, the building permits. On the expenditure, some uh, expenditure assumptions, the employee assumptions are the, are the biggest cost that we really have. Um, there's been no increase in the headcount from those authorized in 2021. So if, there's, if the board has previously authorized those new positions in 2021, they're included in 2022, but there's no other additional new headcount in the budgets for 2022. Uh, we have 2% uh, full-time wage increases uh, for the employees, the pension cost average increase of 10% um, based on talking to our outside medical provider, uh, insurance provider, the medical and prescription costs are increasing at 12%. Uh, and then we have a pre-funding of OPEB in there for a million dollars as well. So if you recall, I probably don't recall <laughs> in detail, but 
this shows the first column here is the funds. Um, the second column shows the projected use or addition to fund balance. If it's a negative number, that's how much we were projecting to use a fund balance as the budget was presented to the board back in March. The next column shows how, what that is today, what we're gonna show today at this presentation and ask the board to adopt on uh, November 23rd, the use of fund balance. And so then we've got the differences noted there. The first line is the general fund. Um, this, this was, I think, the very first um, attachment that was sent to the, to the board with the details of all of the adjustments. There's quite a few of them that were coming to the board. Um, some positive, some negative, but there was a lot, uh, many adjustments coming, coming forth. So all in all, the general fund, initially we were saying we were gonna use $3.6 million of fund balance. What we're gonna ask the board to adopt is using fund balance of $3.3 million of fund balance. So it's a difference of about $335,000. Included in that uh, in, uh, decrease of the use of fund balance, which is to the better. Um, revenue is increasing about $525,000 for permit fees. Uh, Director Smith took a look at that a little bit more closely and based on where we actually are and anticipated to go, we think that has been very conservatively budgeted. So he was comfortable increasing that, but just keep in mind that increase has to go towards building permit. That can't go towards general use of operations. That does have to be used towards the building department, but it does help offset the um, building department expenses. Additionally, there's another half a million dollar increase for revenue sharing due to the census adjustment. We haven't actually seen that come through the state yet. The state hasn't actually increased our revenue sharing payments yet, but they need to and they will make an adjustment. We just haven't seen that yet. So of that 334,000, um, a million dollars of it was an increase in revenue for those items. Uh, overall expenses also increased. It was about a half a million dollars increase for the IT direct, ITI director, the deputy uh, director of MSD and the deputy supervisor position. So we adjusted the budget to account for those that the board had already approved. Um, IT budgets increased about $193,000. $60,000 of that was due to a firewall project that was deferred from 2021 to 22. Uh, and then some servers that were originally omitted from the budget. Building department increased about $157,000. One was for a clerical position the board approved in uh, summer, this past summer. Uh, a couple vehicles and then a part-time electrical inspector. The tree program increased about $40,000 um, because that was some of the work that we also were planning to do in 21. Didn't do, it's gonna happen in 22. Uh, and then the planning increased about 62,000. Um, the big chunk of that was for some intern wages. Uh, and then there were some small increases in the CLS admin and parks as well. So all of those differences in total are the $334,000 of the general fund um, change. Fire Fund was budgeting to use $673,000 of fund balance. Now it's at 1.6 million. The main reason of that is the board authorized the fire apparatus purchase in 21. We aren't gonna get that until 22. That's when we pay it. So we had to increase the budget for that. Initially that was budgeted in 21. The police was gonna use fund balance of about uh, $1.29 million, now $1.38 million. The big chunk of that was for the um, additional um, vehicles, body cameras, and then part-time wages um, for some of the PSAs. Uh, the other big one is the community center. We weren't budgeting to use any fund balance. Now we're budgeting to use $200,000. Uh, that was a decrease in the anticipated revenue that we just haven't, re we haven't recovered yet from the COVID. So that's going down. Going down the rest of them, they're pretty minor decrease or differences, but if you go down to water and sewer fund, there's a, about a $662,000 difference. That was due to some um, capital purchases that are needed this year as well. They have the, they have the cash to be able to purchase those. So um, we were comfortable with that as well. So at the end of the day, oh, just to show some of the capital that changed since you initially saw it, the items in green on these slides are the changes from what the board initially saw. Uh, the community improvement fund, the, actually the first two ones highlighted in green, you, we'll see that the initial budget for that preventative maintenance and community improvement was 350,000. It went down to $300,000, but if you see the next line item down and below in the community, the land improvements for community improvement, we just, we just switched categories there. So that was really just offsetting. 
Um, Pheasant Run needed some pond treatments. There's been some um, issues at, with the ponds at the golf course. So um, we increased the capital for that. CLS had some inspection tablets that were needed. Um, the IT, you can see there was that upgraded firewall. I think there's a pointer somewhere on this. I don't know if it works. I don't know how to do it. I'm not gonna do it. <laughs> you go down to the IT department, um, the replacement computers with monitors, it went from 91,000 to 70,000 because we purchased some monitors this year, so we reduced that. The servers that I mentioned that we needed to purchase um, that were omitted from the budget initially were $45,000. And then the upgrade of the firewalls, that's what was deferred from 21. So we will not spend that on the 21 budget, but we will in the 22. Uh, Recreation has an outdoor movie screen that is needed. Um, there's a picker cart, a driving range picker cart for 15,000 and then a couple of the hybrids that I had just spoken about um, for the building department that we needed for a couple of the new vehicles. Uh, those were incorporated here as well. Those are the non-public safety capital changes. And then on the um, capital, or the public safety capital, uh, we've got the, on the left side in green, that's the fire apparatus that, we spoke, that I spoke about for the fire department moving from 21 to 22 for $900,000. And then on the police side in the green, there's the security cameras for 70,000 and uh, additional cost to purchase hybrid vehicles instead of the, the gas powered vehicles for $10,000. Um, for the 22, just to update on the capital, um, we are st continuing to move through the 2019 through 23 plan adopted by the board for the capital improvement plan. We do have a group of um, staff that are working on expanding that plan for the 22 through 26 uh, year. So we will be presenting that to the board um, moving forward uh, in the future. So it, the plan moving forward in the future is that we are gonna have some of these bold goal, the board goal setting and the capital, the five-year capital in the summer before we actually present the, board, the budgets to the board. So moving forward, that'll be the, the timing of everything, but right now it's a little bit backwards we're gonna catch up and then reverse it uh, for future years. I'm not gonna go over this slide. This is really gonna show you what all of the budgeted revenues um, that will be in the budget um, for the board uh, to review. If there's any questions on these, it's in your handouts. I'm happy to go over these. These are also what was provided in the um, emails to you all. And then we also have the same thing. <coughs> I probably just went too far. Whoop, nope. We also have the same thing for the expenditures. I'm not gonna go through these. We already talked about these at a, um, in detail in March. We covered the differences between them already. But what I will show you is on this slide, the very last column shows the proposed fund balance of where it will be if we used everything that was budgeted. We received all the revenue, received all the expenditures, or paid all the expenditures um, through the year. So basically at the end of this, if we used you see the second column is the proposed 2021 fund balance. This is based on the budgets for 2021. So it starts with the actual fund balance at the end of 20, takes into account what the amended fund balance is for 21, and shows what the proposed fund balance is gonna end up being for 2021. This is the worst case scenario because we never end up using all the fund balance we project to use each year. So the worst case scenario, the very last column shows where the fund balance would be if we spent everything that we were budgeted to spend. You can see in the far right column that everything, um, every fund is in the positive, is uh, in the positive, no deficits, and very healthy fund balances in the general fund. At the top, that would be a, almost a $17 million fund balance. Um, fire is at a 4.9 and police is at a 7.8 million dollar fund balance. Those are the three real big funds that we that we really concern about. But everything has to be positive. So the next steps on the 2022 budget is that we will have a public hearing to adopt the budget as currently presented. If you are comfortable with that, on November 23rd, uh, as we spoke about, we're going to have some further study sessions, uh, further discussions and study sessions moving forward. The next, I think, three study sessions, we're going to be talking about the goals and, and how we incorporate those into the future. Then after we get a feel for the board and where the, where the board wants to go with the goals, we're going to take those, we're going to do five-year projections and try to work all those goals in and have kind of a plan and a time frame on how we're going to incorporate those and make sure financially we can afford everything that we're going to do 
Um, that, is, that study session is on January 18th, slated for that date. So that was a pretty quick highlight on the 2022 budget. Is there any questions on that? probably a record. <laughs> uh, real quick, I want to get into the 2023 budget. Um, so I will start going over just some um, high level things we just talked about, like similar that we talked about for the assumptions for the 22. For the property tax revenue, um, the state has established a 1.7% inflation. No, I'm sorry. That's an estimation, the 1.7% inflation factor for 2023. We use a history of the last 10 years to come up with what the inflation would be. The state, we will know that at the end of, um, it might have actually been announced this pre, just a couple weeks ago, actually, what that inflation factor was, but I use the average of the last um, 10 years to come up with that one. And then the remaining estimation, we're approximating a 1.7% with the new construction. So when we come up with those percentages, um, we work with the planning department to figure out how many permits they think are going to be issued. We work with the assessing department to figure out what the taxable value is estimated to be on that new construction to come up with that revenue percentage increase. Um, Wendy, how does the um, current higher than usual or expected inflation we're currently experiencing factor into these numbers since it's in this year, which we've already budgeted for? So what happens is the state takes a look at every month. They see the CPI for each month um, and based on their fiscal year. So it's October through September. And then they announce what that inflation factor is. And I'm guessing that maybe would have just come out in the last week, maybe if they would have. So I didn't incorporate that into here. But what happens is um, they tell us what that inflation factor is going to be based on their inflation numbers, whatever they're, whatever they're looking at. They announce it. They provide that. I'm not sure what that is, but if it's adjusting, we will adjust these property tax numbers before we adopt the budget based on if the inflation factor is different. So we will still use the estimation of the new growth by what the, and what the assessor estimates those properties to be worth, and then also make an adjustment for the inflation factor if it is truly higher than that. Okay. Before we adopt the budget. Yeah, because it's confusing that like there was probably some inflation number for 2021 that's probably going to be end up being way low for 2021 right cuz are isn't aren't we experiencing like more like 4 or 5% in the last quarter and so and so we can when MSD gets into their presentation Carolyn and I can look up on her computer if that if okay. that new inflation factor has come out yet just to see what it is but it, they take month by month and average it for the year. Yeah. So if in October of, um, tw what year are we in now? I've got so many books. 2021. Sure what year <laughs> in. in October of 2020, when, this, when that would have started, if, it, if the inflation was 1%, that sticks at 1%. So they average it out over the year. So they look at every month's inflation and then divide it by 12 to figure out what that year's inflation will be. So even if it's been really high the last quarter, if it was low in the beginning, it's not going to be high at right. the end of the year. Okay. But we'll take, I'll take a look at that and see if All it's right. significantly different. Thanks. You're welcome. Um, state shared revenue, the state's projecting a 2% increase on their, in their budget as well for sales tax revenue. So we in, increased ours by 2% as well. And again, the other revenues are similar based on the prior year revenues and the estimation of future permits. On the expenditures for 2023, again, there's been no increase in the full-time employees headcount for 2023. Um, we also put in the 2% wage increase or as the current contracts require, if they had them. Um, the pension costs for 2023, again, we est estimated that to be a 10% increase. And then the medical costs actually, our um, insurance provider is estimating a 15% it's not, it's not our insurance provider. It's really a third party who helps us administer them as estimating a 15% between the medical and um, prescription costs. So those are, those are going way up. We've seen a pretty drastic increase in our prescription co 
prescription costs this last year. Um, and then OPEB funding, we also estimated those costs would increase by 15% for our current retirees medical and then added an additional million dollars to pre-fund the OPEB. Uh, and with that, actually, I'm going to end it here for my prescription. I'll get back into the Capitol after the other um, directors have their presentations. So I'm going to flip it over to MSD. And if you'll give me a moment to switch my screen, I will do that. Jill, would you mind taking this over to Jade? Um, Director Smith is going to start for MSD. Can I ask a quick question before we, I don't want to um, mess with your train of thought, but the million dollar OPEB um, that we've been pre-funding, that's consistent with past practice for a while now, right? Correct. Do you have any idea or do you know when the last time we looked at our um, kind of year of expected uh, kind of fully funded to be fully funded on OPEB or um, I understand the cost will probably increase incrementally um, forever, but um, yeah, when do you think we'll get to like 100 percent? Based on our last actuarial valuation, they took a take a look at that, assuming we pre-fund a million dollars each year. And I believe it was 2031 that they were estimating us to be 100 percent. Um, covered by doing the extra million dollars a year. So now, have we done some some larger bulk transfers in as well, though? I believe in twenty. Didn't we last year in twenty nineteen? We paid I, we paid um, an eight million dollar chunk into our pension systems gotcha. in twenty nineteen. There have been past years. I do want to say in twenty seventeen, maybe we paid three million dollars in the three. OPEB. Three. That okay. I think that sounds about. I remember that as well. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, Wendy. I have a quick question. Uh, sure. Since this is my first year, so when you present something that's two years ahead, it's just generally um, a basic um, expenditure. Um, is only just you are only considering the the salaries and wages and nothing else, just a basic um, top level view, is that? No, no, we doing? also include basic operational type expenditures. So, you know, all of the departments have some sort of other type of recurring costs they have, you know, supplies, okay. um, mm -hmm. the professional services, they might need to do some of their normal everyday work. You know, if we've been doing sidewalk gaps of you know, I don't want to steal Jade's thunder, but if we've been doing sidewalk gaps of half a million dollars each year, he's continuing the sidewalk gaps at half a million dollars each year. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Okay. With that, I'll turn it over to Director Smith. Thank you, Wendy. Um, <clears throat> first, want to say, you know, thanks to Wendy and Carolyn and, and her entire team for working with MSD for uh, putting, helping us with our budget. Um, it's going to be pretty high level tonight. As I know, we're going to be going through some of the bigger ticket items uh, that are coming MSD's way as part of the board goals later this month. Um, so I'll just dive right into it. This will be the last presentation I think you see with this logo on there because I think we're going to get a new logo in January. So um, let's switch it up for next year. Oops. All right, um, <clears throat> I'd like to introduce the team here tonight. For those of you that don't uh, know everybody, we've got some new faces. Scott Patrick Sloan, the, the township planner, uh, Rob Kramer, the building official, John Sislinus, or John Z, the new facilities <laughs> manager, Bill Surchek, everybody knows from engineering, and John Selmy, our new DPW manager. So uh, this is MSD. Um, Sticking with the, uh, the theme of staffing, I just wanted to do a quick snapshot of the staffing within MSD um, and how that's broken down. We've got 103 full-time equivalent employees within the various divisions of MSD. Um, the one to take note of that I, that I um, brought attention to this year, which was different, is that we do fund three and a half positions. Although they report to IT, they support the MSD functions in the building, um, planning, and public works. Uh, I'm not, not planning. Um, yeah, planning. Building, planning, and public works divisions as well. Um, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time here too because this is actually the biggest change for MSD. 
we have some additional staffing um, that's occurred in 2021, which obviously is gonna carry through to 2023. And that's where we've seen our biggest change um, in our budget requests, um, in addition to the building department, which we'll get to in a few minutes. But we did have the addition of the MSD deputy director in 2021, uh, hope to have that filled uh, by the end of the year. We did implement a new additional clerk three in the building division because of the demands on that department that was posted in 2021 and is filled. We have an additional engineer that was approved for the 2021. So obviously you'll see that, that expense continue. We filled our DPW superintendent position, which had been vacant for a few years. And then obviously we welcomed the facilities and maintenance division uh, to MSD this year as well. But this is where you'll see some of the bigger, the biggest changes um, in, our, in our budgets. MSD's overall budget is just over $61 million. When you look at all of the funds that we actually have with, that make up MSD, um, I indicated on here, anything that has the, the slash marks, if you will, or the lines, those are enterprise funds, which um, I know tonight we're really talking about general fund dollars. So those are the, the ones you'd see on the left um, from facilities maintenance down to public works in the, in the fleet department. Um, of the $61 million, 16 of that, of the 39.1 is water and sewer, and $16 million supports the rest of MSD operations uh, that's part of general fund. Uh, I think that's all I had there. And then obviously <clears throat> this budget could change depending on what we decide or what the board decides at our uh, study session later this month as far as board goals and some of the bigger projects. The, so the building department, uh, the building and development activities projected to stay flat um, from the last five year average. Although we haven't budgeted accordingly in the past couple of years, we've we budgeted very conservatively. And I've got a slide here in a minute where I can show you um, some trends and why we felt it was um, uh, important to raise the revenue, almost $700,000 this year. Um, we've had back-to-back -back record breaking years for development and we expect this to be pretty static moving forward. And again, we did add a clerk three TPOEM position in the building department in 2021. So this slide here shows the last 11 years of building permit revenue and expenses and why we felt it was important to, to increase that revenue. You can see, I believe <clears throat> in 2010, which you know, probably isn't a really fair comparison because we were in an economic downturn, but if you were to look at 2014 when things started to turn around, you can see we were just about $1.6 million in revenue. And last year, or th through this year, <clears throat> excuse me, we we're already at $3.6 million. And these numbers were only good through October 25th. So we still have two more months of activity that will be reflective on this slide if we update it at the end of the year. And then you can see the expenses have not moved very much since 2010. Um, you may see about a half a million dollars that they've increased in expenses over the course of that time. So very much uh, there's a discrepancy there and we're trying to uh, reflect that more accurately in the budget. So then I took what we're projecting for 22 and 23 and just extended that out so you can see that um, there's still a discrepancy between expenses and revenue, but uh, um, I think we more accurately depicted what the revenue should be in the building department. And the permits that we're tracking here are the building, electrical, mechanical, and plumbing permits only. This doesn't involve anything like plan review or the engineering services uh, that would be included in other divisions. Uh, onto planning, uh, the master plan is expected to be done in 2022, um, so maybe early 2023, but we should should have that done in 2022. We're going to continue uh, through the redevelopment ready and communities uh, program, uh, but the expenses within the planning department pretty much stayed status quo. 2021 was the first year that we actually brought in planning support services from other professional uh, planning companies. It's working out great, and um, I can let Patrick speak to that, or if you guys have any questions on that afterwards, we can, we can go into that. 
And I guess just a note too is, you know, this RRC program, I've, I've said this a few times, as we continue to get built out, we're gonna to start to see more and more demand for redevelopment as opposed to development, which will change the landscape of all MSD divisions. Engineering, um, engineering is predicted to, to stay on course as they have been. They have a very active, you know, the sidewalk repair program, which uh, we increased those dollars Two years ago, um, we maintained the contribution to the sidewalk program. That'll be another discussion for the board at our uh, planning session. Uh, roads, um, this is the first, uh, probably our busiest year that we're forecasting out in the roads uh, department since the millage has been passed. And we all reviewed the five-year, you adopted the five-year roads plan a few months ago. Um, because of some projects that the county did and just watching what MDOT is doing with Ford Road and 275, we may see a change in some of those projects, but all in all, it's still a good guide. And as long as development stays up, we still have our inspectors out in the field inspecting the new developments and subdivisions that are occurring. Uh, facilities, uh, this is a new one for MSD. Um, 2022 will be the first full fiscal year, but 2023, this will be um, our first year setting the budget. Um, obviously, they're gonna be cons concentrating on completing the five-year CIP plan, which we're right in the midst of. We're in year two of that. Um, creating and implementing a preventative maintenance um, and procedures throughout township buildings um, for all of our mechanicals. And then working towards a township-wide facility accreditation program, which John has researched, and um, so we'll be going for an accreditation for all of our facilities. And then some of the uh, board initiatives that we're looking at, which are um, low cost now, because we're doing the research, is um, the planning for our EV, pro, EV um, opportunities throughout the township and what we can do internally um, as far as uh, going more green with our buildings. Uh, public works uh, will continue uh, on the path of our water main replacement and expansion. That's gonna continue into 2023. Um, you can see the projects that are slated for 2023 up there. Um, I have a typo. Um, you can see the, the two projects there. Uh, we'll continue with our um, Stormwater Asset Management and Wastewater Grant that was complete, completed uh, two years ago. Um, we've got findings in there and projects that we'll continue to implement there as well. This is all gonna come out of the water and sewer um, fund. This is, none of this will be general fund dollars. And then one of the big ticket items is listed there at the bottom, but the compost facility, which we'll have um, more conversation in a few weeks in regards to that. 2023 fleet, um, you can see the vehicles that are slated right now. We've got six uh, hybrid explorers in the police department that we would be purchasing, an administrative vehicle and a new rescue squad for the fire department, and then DPW for water and sewer. We're looking at a uh, dump truck and a stake truck with a gate, um, and then a sewer a cleaning jet machine. Um, I did talk to the fire chief and um, as of today, he's on board with an electric vehicle for that admin vehicle, so we're gonna explore that option and see what that looks like, and that will obviously um, in, in involve putting in a charging facility somewhere in the parking lot, which we're in the process of designing that parking lot now. So we should have the infrastructure ready to go. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, that should be a go for 2023. And then we've adopted a policy, kind of an informal policy, but all of our uh, new fleet that moving forward is always looked at for either a hybrid or an electric vehicle and for gr any grant opportunity that's out there. And that was a lot in a really short period of time, but here's some more pictures of our municipal services department. So we're open for any questions at this time. Those are good pictures. We should use them for state of the township. <laughs> We've got a lot. <laughs> Good. Oh, Michael? Yeah, um, Jane, I'm sorry, and I, I apologize. Step out for a second if you mention this, but how's the, um, the deputy municipal MSD process coming along? Good. Uh, we conducted interviews yesterday, and we should have a decision on that by the end of the week. 
Well, that's great to hear. Yes. Um, one of the things I kind of wanted to ask about, especially with um, the roads fund, is I know um, we've had some, some, some bad luck with some contractors in the past, but we've also had some really good relationships with some contractors. And it's a priority of the board um, to move to a responsible contracting model. And I'm just curious if we have existing contractors, uh, and I'm thinking about the ones who have given us multi-year contracts where they've kept prices steady while our costs have, while the cost of materials have increased, the cost of labor has increased. Um, is there a plan to help some of the current vendors who we've got a long track record of working with, who give us a good product, who are fun to work with, and who are cost effective? to try to ensure that they meet those standards of the responsible contracting model? Because I, I would hate to see a, a, a situation where um, either the cost of doing business substantially increases in Canton Township and we get less road work done, or we're forced to go with a, a vendor who maybe doesn't deliver the same level of service that we're comfortable with or fit well with our organization. And so I just was like, I don't know if that's on your radar, if that's something you've thought about, um, it's just one of the things that kind of keeps me up as I drive down, um, you know, Sheldon Road, and I'm just absolutely amazed um, at how great it turned out. And I'm like, wow, more of this, please. Like more of this in the township as we continue this program. Yeah, I think that's something that once we hone in, and I know we're continuing to meet on the responsible contracting, once we actually have a good uh, feel for what that's going to look like, we could share that with, with some of our big contractors. Um, I will say at the board meeting next Tuesday, there's two RBAs coming before you to extend contracts for some of our very good uh, contractors for next year's road projects. So, um, and we've got some good justification behind why we want to continue to use them. And a lot of what uh, Michael said is, is because of that. So, um, but we can, once we get a better look and feel of the responsible contracting language, we could talk to them and see if it's gonna give anybody a heartache. Stephen. Thank you. Um, thanks for the presentation. It's uh, always good to see all the things that we're doing in the township. Um, the question I had was when you talked about permitting, um, uh, have you seen any um, decreases in permitting due to uh, the con uh, general contractors uh, having lack of labor because of what's going on in the world today or lack of raw materials, resources, things like that? Um, I think that could be answered like both ways maybe. Okay. And part of it we may not know. The number of permits have not decreased. Are we seeing a somewhat is it slowed down? We're right now it has. Complaints from contractors are both lack of material. Okay, so yes. So it has but we've had another record-breaking year in permits this okay. year. So although we're doing really well right now, the market's going to actually push what maybe what's going to happen in 2022. Okay, I'm just wondering if you had to think about that in terms of your projections for 2023 or 2022. Yeah, it, it, I don't know that I've looked at it so much from the financial aspect, but we've actually talked about it operationally because we're seeing some very large delays on getting uh, material in for our own projects. Uh, water meters came up, I mean, 30 week lag time, is that what it was? 36 what? week lag wow. time to get water meters in. Um, and, we're, and with all of the development we have and all the water taps that we have out there, the last I knew, we're, we're, it's gonna be tight. This is also the start of our season that is more dormant than the rest of the season. So right. I think it'll catch up with itself okay. as far as the supply. Yeah, it just no one knows when it's gonna end and mm -hmm. what it's gonna look like. And if the contractors are putting, pushing projects further and further out, that may lower the number, but demand <laughs> keeps going up. So, right. all right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there any hands on attendees? I can't see. I can't see that tab. Nope. Just to give some more information on the building department too, because I forgot to add it to the slide, but we've actually exceeded 13,000 permits this year. 
And how does that relate to previous? Um, we were, I believe, number two in the region last year to some yeah. community in Macomb Township. And I, I don't know what they were at this year, but I mean, we're, we're well over a thousand more than we were last year at the end of the year. So we've mm. we by far exceeded that. Wow. SEMCOG usually puts out a really good report towards the end of the beginning of next year. We'll show all of the activity and, okay. and equate that to dollars. And <clears throat> Great. Okay, no more questions online either. All right, thank you, Jade. Next Perfect. Up is thank you Director very much. Boss and Elise. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. See you later. <laughs> Good evening. Hey. Good evening. Good evening. All right, all right. Well, we have uh, the Canton Police Department's uh, 2023 proposed budget. What we try to do is maintain direct lines into our um, strategic plan that was approved by the board a few years ago, and we're coming into the fourth year in 22 of that uh, strategic plan, which had seven goals. Tonight, I have with me as Craig Wilshire, Police Deputy Chief, and we have Barb Crusoe in the back who put this presentation together and does a lot of work for us, all the work for us when it comes to budget. She, she's exceptional, so she's in the back there hiding, but uh, she's here with us today. And she also performs that function too at the fire department. So, What we do, we do it every year as we explain the budget process and how it works for the police department. So if you follow the process, we open the budget request submission period, the deputy chief reviews the request, I review the request, the finance director reviews the request, the township supervisor reviews the request, then you do. And those projects, those larger projects will come in front of you for approval. Here's our organizational chart. Uh, you know, we're around 98,000 people and this is our current uh, organization. Uh, we have chief, my, uh, which is me, the deputy chief, we have seven lieutenants and four in the patrol. One is in special services and the other one's in investigations. Under them, there are sergeants that are under their command. So you can see how it's spread out and you have that in your packet. We used the last known uh, census data because right now we can't compare to the other organizations because we don't have all the information compiled yet from those comparable agencies. As you can see, cost per capita uh, with our 21 budget is uh, $263.43. is a little bit under uh, the average. And you can see more comparable agencies in our areas like Farmington Hills, Livonia, and Dearborn. Dearborn has uh, incredible numbers of personnel. And that's why you'll see uh, the uh, cost per capita being so high. We expect to have this updated in 2022. And one good thing about Canton, we've traditionally, and we've held to that, you can see the percentage that are assigned to the patrol division are at 81%. And uh, right now that's probably leading in comparison to those other agencies. We try to look for alternative funding. We're fortunate enough to have been a part of uh, a number of forfeiture actions with criminal forfeiture. Uh, you can see 1.4 million over the last 10 years have been used for to buy some of those high dollar items um, to keep them new, keep them, uh, the equipment up to par for our officers. Uh, the K-9 program is supported by the forfeiture funds. The JAG grants, which is to the left, we use a little bit of that opportunity when we're approved through the JAG for body armor for our officers. That, that's kept up every five years. The True NART drug detection system, uh, um, it's very nice because it keeps our officers uh, away from physically touching drugs like fentanyl, which could really hurt our officers. So you can see some of the uh, alternate funding that we've used over the years. Average response times and cost for service. If you look at this, 2020, we're going to have to throw out the door. Um, but you do see a dramatic uh, decrease in cost for service. I think we're on par. And you see that in the updates that come out through Amy Houston. Um, we're on par to probably get closer to about 47, 48,000, I think, this year. So we're getting closer to where we were before. But 
what we did uh, in the last five years, we started looking at the res what the actual response time was, and that's from the phone call to the, when we knock on the door. Now, that doesn't take into account for these real emergent situations. Some of those do include the downtime waiting before we actually do dispatching for the non-emergency calls. Uh, here's our crime history. If you look at uh, the last five years, the violent crime and the property crime, these are considered part one crimes, and you can see we're considerably down for 2020. We're trending at a 9.7%, um, I believe, down from 2019 currently. But you see the trend. It's pretty steady throughout the years, and we have a, a, a crime rate that's about 9% down what it had been in 2019. I, I don't really count 2020, but you'll see in the updates that we're 10% above what 2020 was for the crime this year. And if you figure out the violent crime is some of the things that we find that uh, is trending upwards with aggravated assault. And we can attribute some of that to some training that occurred probably in 16 or 17, if I'm not mistaken. But it, it improved our officers' ability to investigate crimes like uh, aggravated assault, which means in a domestic situation like um, strangulation and things like that, so that we saw a dramatic increase after that training over the last four or five years. Here's uh, some significant changes, and that's a plus or five, uh, or plus minus of $5,000 for the items that we list here. The public safety uh, program expansion for 20, 23, we're looking at increasing that dramatically because we're moving our dispatch center into another location in the building. And we still have um, the, the cell block that needs to be um, manned. We need to have personnel there to watch prisoners. It's one of the highest, higher risk areas of our, our uh, service. And we're gonna double, those are part-time positions. They maintain the care and custody of the prisoners. So we're gonna increase the staffing in that area. Range supplies, 5,000. When you look at canine supplies, it looks, and uh, police equipment, we're down 8,000 there in the for, forfeiture program expenses. Um, at the bottom there, the uh, Michigan Police Illegal Advisors contract is up $7,000, and that's in a police attorney that performs um, police legal advice for us, and that his hours have increased. When you look at uh, some changes here with our training and education, we're down $5,000 here. The Power DMS is a software suite that allows uh, instant access to our policies and procedures and training updates. Also offers opportunities for testing. Uh, Feral software subscription has to do with our ability to uh, use our 3D scanning for accident investigation and crime investigations. Uh, we removed L3 back office solution. It's, that was with, I believe, our, our uh, in-car cameras, if I'm not mistaken, and body cams. And uh, we increased on some other subscription costs, 4350 for um, That shows the increase there. The annual, annual charge for maintenance uh, with our vehicles, these, uh, this does not include purchasing the vehicles, but just the maintenance of our uh, patrol fleet and uh, administrative car fleet is 434,000. That's an increase of 22,000. Uh, risk management insurance, up 35,000. Indirect costs is 1.5 million. That went down 62,000, almost 63,000 for 2023. Uh, and you see $5,000 contingency for accessories for computers. Looking at the capital outlay for 2023, we, we are gonna remove the GPS tracking system that we were scheduled to purchase or consider purchasing, but it doesn't look like it's gonna work. That was a system that shot out darts at cars as they fled away from us. It doesn't look like it's gonna work for us, so we're gonna remove it. Um, the security uh, system camera upgrade, we're due for that. Uh, new computers, laptops, and printers, that's outside the scheduled replacement. We have 8,000 in there for that. Ink our computer replacements, ink our printer replacements, they're uh, scheduled right there. The gun range pavilion, we added 21,000 plus there. There's, the range is pretty large. This is an area of uh, minor shelter for the officers when they're uh, out exposed in either the, the sun or the winter when they're practicing and um, qualifying for their um, annual 
shoots, which includes at least four times a year for the handguns, and our long guns, and shotguns. Um, the, sec the second access door for the gun range, it provides more realistic training for a building that we have down there. It's an old building. Um, it only has one door. It allows for a uh, second access door and escape door as we uh, practice different types of training. And you can see some uh, conversion parts. Ford uh, improved their explorers, and part of that causes us to buy new retrofit items in the back for prisoner protection. And the taser, that's a normal replacement uh, rotation program for our officers. Every five years, we replace the, uh, the taser. So, Chad, could you go back to that slide? Yes. Um, that um, 139,728, is that um, correct? It's just, it's not making sense to me. Did you take the 54,000 out? We forgot to take the 54,000 out, I believe, right? I have to figure okay. that out. I'll get back with you with an answer on that. It, okay. it does include the 54,000 in the total. Mm. Okay. Uh, the budget breakdown, as you can see, the primary breakdown for our budget is tied up with wages and fringe uh, benefits. We have, when you look at the indirect costs, the transfers out, we have about 12% of actual budget we can use for the police department outside of just the cost of running and operating a police department. Some items that are developing, the dispatch and building renovation, the design and development phases in process. We have construction bid solicitation expected March 1st. Parking lot improvements, MSD is working very hard for us with that, with the parking lot and fence. Staffing levels, I will, um, we're looking to restore the second deputy chief position in the coming uh, year, uh, and additional police officer positions. I will provide the board with uh, uh, some information on our staffing study. These are aligned with goals one and two, which is a development, implement a workforce plan and increase departmental staffing levels that, were, that was approved in 18. Ongoing education and training, you know, the law enforcement is in a period of um, reform. And one of the things that we focus on is holistic and constitutional policing. And when you look at goal three and four, enhancing our partnerships with our community and community engagement, these things are uh, primary focus here with our education and training program at the police department. Uh, De-escalation techniques, you're gonna see an item at the next board meeting. It's, it's, uh, virtual reality goggles, and it puts you in the environment of actual training in real situations that change and uh, uh, mutate, and it's just very, very, very much amazing once you get to see it. And at some point, we'd like to run uh, the board through it if it's approved. I'm going to turn E911 budget over to Craig Wilcher. So as we look at the 911 budget for 2023, uh, we share the 911 center with the fire. Uh, department, so we both we both utilize those services. Um, looking at the uh, 91 budget, the things that we look at are local surcharges collected on phone bills. That's where we, we get the revenue from for 911 services. Uh, these funds are distributed to communities uh, based on census population. As you'll see, the numbers when I get the estimates, those are estimates on the former census. So we'll still we're still waiting for the updated numbers to understand where it's going to actually stand in 2023. Uh, restricted use funds, we can only use these for items that are related to the call taking center. So uh, phones, radios, dispatch, equipment, furniture, and then call taker salary. Over the last couple of years, we've, we've held uh, the funds in order to fund the dispatch uh, renovation. So we've, we've, we've held those funds and, and uh, waiting for that. Uh, looking in 2023, we estimate, again, based on the current census population, $451,700 estimated revenue. Um, and then some other things that may change are the proposals in uh, House Bill uh, 5026, which has, has some fee schedule changes that may come along with, again, changing the fees for the, the 911. So we may up those, um, looking at, I think they go in effect in March of 2022. Um, so those will also impact that, that budget number. Uh, I'll go too fast. So looking at uh, some of the increases, the significant, we have a battery backup system. We had to replace our battery backup system. It was old and outdated. Um, so we put we got a new system, and this is the part of the annual service fees that go along with that. 
and then also our update radios, we you know purchase radios for both police and fire out of the 911 budget in order to uh, you know keep those current and you know we keep adding it, especially if we're going to add officers and, and increase our staffing. That'll be something else we have to look for. And some of the other projects we're looking at, uh, as the uh, director said, uh, we're looking at the dispatch expansion. Uh, you know we'll be moving our dispatch center in March of 2022. The uh, project will begin in May of. Of 22 and probably ending in early 2023 we'll have that completed according to the schedules bids will go out early next year uh, for that project uh, so design and, and develop is in progress and then we again looking to you know relocate the phones the furniture and then uh, again prisoner intake and monitoring will be a problem we're going to have to um, outfit some offices so that the psas who are down there actually have the ability to monitor from not only visually but from also uh, video screens and things of that nature so those are the upgrades that we'll have Questions? Any questions online? Please. Oh, go ahead, Stephen. Um, just trying to understand your developing areas of interest. Are those things that could be added to the budget next year and uh, amend through amendments and things like that? That's correct. We're looking at uh, a potential amendment for 2022 budget with the deputy chief position and potential officers, but we want to show you some of the staffing study and information that support that. Okay. Okay. So you're not presenting those as changes right now, but no. okay. That's I just want to make sure I understood. Anyone else? I have a question. Okay, Tanya. Yeah. So, uh, Chad, you you mentioned something about uh, you know uh, we is this budget going to. Uh, incorporate the board goals like you know we have um, probably have the social worker program that might expand in the future or things like that so is that going to be incorporated in the presentation will you will these be considered um, in the in the modified budget that's going to be presented in January because I I didn't see much about you know uh, apart from uh, consideration for the, uh, you know, the goals that were there two years ago, I, I didn't see anything for the future goals of the board. So, uh, will that be incorporated in the uh, in the future amendment to the budget that will be presented in January? Two things. I, I believe um, in the coming month of November, we're going to be able to present, there's three major items, uh, board goals that we're going to be able to address in depth, which include our diversion program, our civilian oversight program. Um, we'll be able to address those items at that point, including our dashboard. Um, that's really progressed a lot, and we'll be able to hit on those items at those board meetings. The social worker, um, I can preview that right now. She had, uh, in the first two months of being in existence, and most of it, uh, uh, she's been inside, but there has been quite a bit of training. She's received 90, she's received 90 referrals in two months of work. So the expectation is we're gonna come back to the board with, uh, and, and I would imagine ask for a second social worker at some point, and that would include a, um, a budget and amendment too. As you saw with our fund balance that today, it looked like it was 7.8 and that's Looks like over 30% fund balance at this point. So I believe we'll be able to support it for a period of time. Okay. Yeah, I, not just talking about social worker program, you also mentioned about the diversion program and all those um, you know, other programs that meet the kind of the board goals for welcoming communities. So I think, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Anyone else? No? Okay. Thank you. Thank okay, you for the thank presentation.
So good evening. <clears throat> Obviously, you know who I am. And then this is Jamie, uh, Jamie Strasner, our uh, deputy chief. And just like Chad said, we've got Will Smith, uh, not Will Smith, <laughs> Will Hayes in the back. <laughs> Will Smith. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Barb Caruso. So obviously uh, you'll see this presentation looks very um, similar to the police presentation. So um, we'll probably be able to move through it pretty quickly here um, because I know that uh, a lot of this stuff was repeat from uh, earlier in the year when we went through it with you. So. <laughs> Uh, just like the uh, director of police said, uh, this is the same process that uh, he uses uh, when he does his reviews, and we, we use the same process as we move through the budget uh, approvals and requests uh, with the township. Uh, and the fire um, staffing side, uh, the only change you'll see compared to last year is that we've added that training officer through contract negotiations. Our goal is to have that filled by January. We're working with HR right now to get that position uh, through the testing process. So it looks like probably by January that will be filled. Um, and as we move forward, um, we'll get them up on staff and we have to hire one more personnel. But other than that, we're at full staffing right now. So you can see that we have the 69 firefighters broken down to 23 per shift. And then we've got fire prevention as well as um, Jamie and myself. <laughs> so just like uh, the police there, this has not been updated. We update this in January. Um, the only difference that you'll see um, is that we still have that 90,000 uh, population in there. So we know that the Canton Township came back at 98 plus. Um, bringing our total sworn per 1,000 down on the percentage a little bit. And we're still one of the lowest in the um, area for stations, um, which we've already had that study session on and we'll talk about again. So federal grant funding, uh, you know that we've been um, very fortunate on the fire side to pick up a lot of grants. Um, we have uh, really uh, put a lot of effort into that over the past five years, uh, received millions of dollars worth the grants, whether it was monitors, um, COVID expenses, um, our uh, staffing, um, all those things. Recently, our physicals um, that we received 150,000 on, um, and we'll continue to apply for those grants as they come up. I know that um, Will was also talking about some more grant opportunities uh, that maybe we can get reimbursed on through FEMA for the use of the schoolhouse for vaccinations and um, the summit when we were doing the vaccinations over there. So we'll also seek those grants out in the near future here as well. And I will turn this over to Deputy Chief for the stats. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, this first slide here is just going to, we're just going to go over a couple of statistical slides. Uh, this first one is just uh, a total run number uh, for uh, fire and EMS runs. And I think the big, the big number here that we should be looking at is the 2020 number, which is definitely down. We reported on this earlier in the year, but uh, the first six months of this year, so January through July, we've noted that we were at uh, a significantly higher level. So we're gonna get back to the 2019 levels of, of run volume, which is kind of like what we expected with the, COVID, uh, with the COVID downturn last year. We definitely expected to see that. I can also say that for the last four or five months, uh, it's been going even more crazy, it seems like, so the run volume is just really increasing. So I believe that even with our projected numbers here, we're probably gonna go above those as well. Uh, here's our emergent uh, response time. So this is a 911 call to the time that the ambulance or fire engine arrives on scene. And uh, happy to report that uh, these are all going in the right direction. Uh, this past year, we've added personnel with the addition of Station 2 and the additional units out there. And uh, for our first six months this year, our fire average response time for emergent uh, responses was 8 minutes and 13 seconds, and EMS was 740. So that reduction in time, we're expecting that to continue, and we're very happy to report that. And then the final one that I have is the mutual aid slide. And uh, this one is also important just as we continue to increase manpower. It's a resiliency thing for us. We really wanna be sure that uh, we're able to take care of the runs and that we don't have to have that many mutual aid requests. Every time that request is made, that's 
typically a, a Canton fire engine that might arrive on scene, but it's another agency's ambulance that's taking that patient to the hospital. And uh, we prefer that obviously not to happen, as I'm sure all the citizens do as well. Uh, but uh, projected for 2021, we're at 38 mutual aid requests. And uh, that's a significant, uh, that's, that's trending in the right direction for us. So we're very happy to report that as well. Yeah, so just talk, touching on that subject again, and that goes back to the, you know, the station four request that, or um, I should say suggestion that we brought forward to you. Um, that just goes to show you when we staffed that extra ambulance over there, redid our, um, our staffing you know, evaluation, put that extra squad and service over there. That's exactly what, it, what it's ended up being, you know, 38 compared to 74 back in the day there. So um, it's going, like you said, in the right direction. And I believe that uh, even going back to this uh, slide here with those response times, we, we are seeing that uh, improve, A, because we've got that ambulance in that area to respond instead of having somebody from station one go up to that area when that ambulance is already out of service um, responding to another run. So those, that's, that's how we're seeing that those time increases or decreases, I should say, um, and improving our, our service to the citizens. So moving on to the actual changes of the uh, budget, um, we've listed anything that's uh, 5,000 or more. Uh, you can see that we've got holiday overtime, which is obviously contractual. And the majority of these things are kind of out of our control. We're, we're moving forward with uh, ALS supplies. Obviously, we're going on more runs. We're going to spend more money on supplies. Uh, firefighters, we, we've gained more firefighters over the past few years. Um, that costs more uh, to outfit them correctly and uh, make sure that we're replacing that turnout gear every 10 years as NFPA requires. Um, our contracted services, this is the uh, legal services that we use over in PSD. Fire hasn't uh, traditionally used them too much, so we're kind of backing out of that, leaving it more to the police side. Um, and they're, they've picked up a little bit of that um, contract cost and we've decreased our side on that. Uh, moving into uh, uh, Acumed, another thing that was kind of out of our control, but it's an offset um, as Wendy um, got some information last week. We've, we're seeing some good projections on our billables um, through the insurance company in the next year. Uh, I believe they were 5%, right? 5.8%, I think it was. Um, so <clears throat> we're going to see an increase in the revenue side of that. Although Acumed, the more, the more we bill with the uh, more runs, we'll see that increase. Uh, medical, ex medical exams, these are the exams that we've talked about where we received the grant, so why it's... Um, a deficit, we have to show that in there because we're going to be spending the money. Um, we will be getting that back at least uh, for 21 and 22. So, I'm sorry, 22 and 23. Um, and then fleet maintenance charges, obviously it costs us some money to uh, maintain that through um, fleet services. Uh, Got to keep those trucks on the road and those ambulances on the road to uh, make sure. Um, it is one point that I will point out is uh, we're very grateful that uh, we have that ability to service these vehicles in house. Um, not a lot of communities have that and we, they send their vehicles out and that creates a long delayed time for that service to get done and get those vehicles back. We really can't afford to go down a vehicle. Um, we've got one extra squad. Um, when that thing goes down, you know, we're at the bare minimum. So uh, Jody's over there fixing that stuff. So kudos to him for uh, making sure that we're always on the road. Uh, liability insurance, um, I don't know exactly why we went up in MMRA, but probably because the price of our fire engines continue to go up and, and we, we buy new ones and, and keep the uh, equipment great for our firefighters. So thanks to you guys. Um, this is one of the side effects of that. So um, indirect costs paid to, metal, to general funds, obviously we don't have control over that. And then uh, furniture and appliances, we're looking at uh, some appliance replacements and stuff. Um, this is our computers that we uh, service all in, inside every ambulance. We do our, all of our run reports on those, so we have to upgrade those annually as well. And then finally, our capital outlay. Um, as Jade, or Director Smith, spoke about, we've got the uh, prevention vehicle and the, the rescue unit. Uh, just like the past year, we'll probably end up amending that and putting it in 22 just to get it ordered in 22 because we probably won't see that delivery until 23 again so you'll probably see that come forward next year as an amendment uh, our machinery and equipment 
Um, this is just be for the, the extra $20,000 that we need to um, outfit those uh, apparatus as they come in next year. And then obviously um, technology upgrades for the, the modems. This is more the deputy chief's uh, area of expertise, but uh, I believe they're well over 10 years old now. So we're trying to get those upgraded so that we can get better technology and the firefighters can communicate those uh, run reports to the hospital a little easier. And so just to break down on our budget, you can see that our salaries and uh, fringe benefits uh, total about 84% of the salary. Um, and then we got those indirect costs and stuff like that. So really we control a little bit of the budget as far as um, you know what we're choosing to spend the money on or directing the money towards. Um, but it certainly um, paints the big picture where the majority of our fund balance or our funds go. <laughs> And then finally, we'll work on um, the things that we said, uh, dispatch renovations uh, with the police department. We're continuing to move forward with that. Uh, we just had a meeting this week, and it looks like we'll be uh, estimated to uh, go out to bid in March. So uh, moving right along with that stuff, uh, I believe that uh, it's gonna be state of the art and we'll be able to um, service this community for years in the future. So the next uh, police and fire chief aren't gonna have to worry about it for some time. Um, with uh, the fire inspector position, um, I know that I brought it up in the past um, in our study session. I wanna get it on your radar, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, as Director Smith talked about, we've got a lot of building permits coming in and it's very hard for our prevention to keep up with that. Um, we, we go out there and we do those inspections right along with the building department, um, especially the reoccupancies as they come forward. Um, something to consider, uh, we definitely, know that um, we have a fire marshal that's eligible to retire at any point and uh, we're looking to get those positions so we have that succession planning in place um, so we'll be bringing that to you and then i don't have to mention about station four because i've kind of beat that to death for you guys so <laughs> it's on your radar so do you have any questions on the fire department side of things and i can, can get into emergency management this is gonna be a long one, so sit back, because uh, I'll, I'll say Will Smith again. <laughs> no. Any questions on fire department? All right. Nope. Online, did they have any questions? Thank you. None. Thanks for your presentation. All right. So uh, Will Hayes, obviously, um, our emergency manager, he just gave us a nice long lecture today on how we operate the EOC. So we appreciate his work here and uh, he's very valued, even though he's behind the scenes most of the time, but uh, couldn't have got through COVID without him. Um, but obviously his, um, he falls underneath the police and fire department. Um, so he comes to us for all the budget requests. Um, everything that um, he does, he runs, he runs through us. Um, that's budgeted out of the general fund, even though we oversee him. And uh, we get some uh, salary match through the um, EMPG, so through the state. He basically fills out his own paperwork to get his salary back, so we appreciate that. <laughs> and there's his increases for uh, 23, so. <laughs> It's a, it's a first, right? That's unacceptable. <laughs> <laughs> he was begging me before we came in here to change it for him, but I told him no way. <laughs> so, so that's really it on the emergency management side. Obviously, um, like I said, I, I give him kudos for all the work that he's done and, and getting us in place. We couldn't receive any of these federal grants if he weren't doing the work that he was behind the scenes and uh, keeping us up and running and uh, making sure we have everything in place uh, to receive those federal grants. So thank you to him and thank you to Barb for all their, their work uh, behind the scenes for us. So. Any questions? And to Wendy for getting us all the money when we ask for it. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, just, Steven. I'll just say thank you both uh, police department and fire for the last year, <laughs> last 18 months really, and uh, the amount of work that you've all had to do under stressful times. So um, in terms of the budget, no, it looks as great as it always has in the last nine years that I've seen it. So uh, I don't have any further questions. We appreciate that, thank you. 
No, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for the presentation. Thank you. Next up is Director Hohenberger. <laughs> How many times do we have to tell you that the last group needs to bring snacks? <laughs> snacks? Come on. Got cut from the budget. <laughs> <laughs> then it's our fault. Let's make a note. <laughs> Here's snacks for Steven. <laughs> if that helps, we'll do whatever it takes. Okay. Sir. All right. Thank you all for the opportunity to be here tonight. We're, uh, Last couple of years, we've done a video, but uh, we're not doing that this evening uh, as things are just a little bit different with the way that we're presenting the budget this year. Um, try and keep things exciting for you like they've been all night. Uh, we have with us tonight, uh, John LaFever, our deputy director, and Jeanette Aiello, our business coordinator. Both of okay. them have done a fair amount of work to help pull this together, Jeanette especially, and Peg Stevens, who's not here. Um, also does a fair amount of work to help pull all of this information together to help us look good. Um, hopefully we can provide you with everything you need to know about leisure services. Um, so we started off, um, what we wanted to do for our budgets is to really show an overview of the last three years, 18 through 20, of what we uh, spent or earned in different categories for uh, the budget and then a three-year average for that but we didn't want to just provide the three-year average number and then get, show you the 2022 and 2023 because um, we wanted to uh, unfortunately it's a lot of numbers up there but we really wanted to provide some context to those because obviously 2020 um, had some significant challenges with COVID in there and um, really skews those three-year averages so if we went with just the three-year average, we'd have to provide a lot of explanation for every single item. So this is general fund budgets for leisure services as a whole. Um, we'll run through what makes up this full budget, but just wanted to give you a full picture of the overall budget here. Um, and as we go through any of these, feel free to stop me at any point if you want to have questions on any particular slides. Um, that way we don't have to go all the way back and then come you know, hit reverse by 10 slides to get back. So feel free to holler at me at any point along the way here. These are two pretty um, static budgets right here, cemeteries. Uh, we do have three historical cemeteries. Um, only one of those is still active. There's no more plots available, but um, we there still are internments at that plot. Those are done through our DPW department. Um, this budget is primarily just maintaining the, uh, the cemeteries, the, the lawn, the trees, the stones, those sorts of things. Social services, this budget is made up of um, our transportation program, which is a lion's share of this budget, some funding for growth works, as well as our senior alliance program. All of the revenue is for the grants that come in for the um, senior transportation program. There is funding in 22. You'll notice the operating expenses go down from 22 to 23. There's funding in the 22 budget for a transportation strategic plan. Um, we did do an RFP for that this fall and found out that uh, funding will not be enough to cover a strategic plan. So that will be something that will come forward in the goal session that we have coming up in uh, later in November and early December for the board to decide um, what you would like to do. If you'd want to add funding to this to cover the full plan or just remove it completely and do, go in a different direction. Um, senior services, these are all the programs that are housed for our Club 55 program. Uh, the majority of these programs are hosted out of the summit, but we do have several transportation programs, trips, um, trip to Mackinac Island, casinos, um, other local attractions that um, are come out of this budget as well. Um, really no significant changes in here. You'll see 2020, obviously, um, we had a significant decrease in our revenue. 
Um, 2021 is rebounding and a lot of our revenue projections for not only seniors, but for a variety of our budgets are gonna be based on returning to normal. Um, but a lot of those are an educated guess because we can't really look back at the last time we had a pandemic and how people reacted and what the participation looked like. And some of our, our programs are also contingent on staffing, which we're really struggling with getting adequate staff for a lot of our programs. Um, so that's been an effect on uh, the, the type of programs and revenue as well. Um, any questions on these so far? You can go back 100 years ago to the last pandemic and look at We could, we could, <laughs> um, but there's not a whole lot of information. We tried looking at it, but we really didn't, we really didn't garner much information out of that. Uh. Um, leisure services, administration, we really need to work on our revenue out of this, um, this budget in particular. Um, this is really all of our administrative expenses. Our salaries come out of here. Our marketing for the entire department comes out of this budget. So a lot of those static expenses we do have in 2022. You recall this year we worked on our master plan. Next year, we'll be working on our strategic plan, which is more focused on um, operational internal goals and how we can help meet the um, township goals as far as operations go and programming goes. The master plan is more focused on uh, physical assets and the, the future direction of the, the physical pieces of the, um, the plan for our department going forward. And then 2023 already, we have budgeted for our CAPRA reaccreditation. Re it seems like that just happened and it'll be it's on the calendar again. This will be our fourth time through, fourth or fifth? Fourth. fourth time through the accreditation process for our department. So while it should seem like old hat, there's always new challenges with that. And we have to budget to bring in our accreditation folks to come in and do their review for us. And then we added uh, funding in 22 and 23 for tablets and other infrastructure pieces for um, incident reports and inspection reports. We're really looking to go digital with those things. Right now we're doing all of that manually with pen and paper um, and our IT department, Tasha specifically, has done a great job of working with some technology that we already have to build out um, a process that we can utilize digital um, inspection sheets and incident report sheets, which will provide us a lot of streamlined operations and help hopefully with our risk management to ensure that we don't miss anything. Um, but she's done that without any additional cost for any software type thing. So she's, she's done a fantastic job and been a great asset to help us with that. But in order to do that, we need the, the digital um, tablets to be able to do that and some potential Wi-Fi expansion and connection things so that people are able to utilize those, um, that technology. And um, this is the first budget where you'll see in the majority of our budgets down here at the bottom, this 401 capital. So that is how finance has broken out the CIP items across all of the different budget so those are our, our the CIP allocations for any expenses for um, different portions of our budget. Uh, parks so our parks department um, we're getting back to normal operations in here as well there's really the biggest significant change in this budget is fifty thousand dollars for replacement of utility carts in 2023. So this, these are several of our utility carts that have been deferred for a number of years um, and are hanging, hanging together with duct tape, rubber bands, and chewing gum. Um, if anyone wants to take a ride in one of those, we'd be happy to take you for a ride and you'll see why those need to be replaced um, probably a few years ago. Um, biggest challenge in here is with our wages and fringes in terms of just filling all of our positions and that's kind of across the board something that I've talked about previously and again the the 401 capital for our CIP allocations at the bottom here 
um, but really no significant changes in this budget. Our sports center budget here. So sports, so a lot of times this gets viewed at as just the sports center budget and we refer to that uh, just because it's, it's easy, but really sports happen across the township. The sports center is just the um, kind of hub for all of those activities, but we have volleyball that um, happens in the parks and in the summit, and we have baseball that happens across the township. So really any sports activity um, that's coordinated by leisure services um, gets accounted for within this budget here. Um, we have seen uh, obviously 2020, our revenue was way down in here. 2021, we saw a fantastic bounce back. We're not fully back to pre-COVID levels, but our tournament revenue, uh, tournament participation, the league participation has really bounced back. This fall, we had um, more softball leagues than we've had in a number of years. Some of our contracted programs like uh, tennis and lacrosse saw just um, a banner year this year um, to where we um, just did not expect the participation that we saw in there. We have applied for a grant for improvements at the sports center. So that's where you see the um, grant revenue here, as well as the capital improvements down here. We should be finding out soon whether or not we receive the, that grant. And if we do, then we would have that expense and revenue. If we don't, then that would get removed from the budget. So. Okay. Great. Yes. Um, I, I understand 2020 um, on your total page and some of these breakouts, 2019 looked down in revenue from 2018. And last one in this one, it was contributions and donations. I'm not sure if it is for all of them. Was there something going on with contributions and donations in 2019 or? So contributions and donations in this particular budget in 2018, that was the Wayne County funding that we received for um, improvements to the infields at uh, the sports center. So that was the, the third quad that we did out there. So you would see that there's um, capital improvement dollars down here for that as well. So those correlate together. Um, if I go back to parks, parks um, that was also um, funding that we received for um, uh, Patriot Park Engineering and Design. No, nope, that's okay. Oh yeah, Heritage Park ball fields and fencing um, okay. in there. So that was so that a was big some... year for Wayne County funding of improvements. Correct, and we received some funding from uh, GCYBSA as well for, for okay. those improvements there. So those were just the recognition of the, the contributions from those units that helped us build those different projects. I see, okay. Uh, let's see, did I cover every, any, any other questions on sports? Um, I think I covered everything on my list there. All right, so we'll cruise over to recreation. So recreation, this budget covers all of our special events, classes, programs that happen out of the summit that are not directly related to like our, our fitness programs. Those come out of the, the fitness budget, but all of your enrichment programs, your summer camps, your uh, therapeutic recreation programs, Thursday night concerts, Liberty Fest, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, th this staff has been um, extremely um, progressive in the way that they've reacted to some of the challenges from the pandemic with the, all of the unique special events that you're seeing um, that are really pushing the creative juices for, for these staff. They've really come up with some fantastic items out there. We saw the Diwali celebration a few weeks ago. We've got the holiday walk coming up where you'll see lights in Heritage Park. Um, the, the, the visits with Santa last year during the, the pandemic was just ways to really think outside the box and bring services to the individual when, when we were uh, really challenged with these programs. Um, big, 
obviously 2020, huge loss in earned income there because that, that's so su supported by user fees. Those have really uh, rebounded, but again, not back to pre-pandemic levels. Um, one example of, of big revenue piece for us is um, our summer camp program, which this summer we limited that to 50% capacity just for COVID precautions, but then that obviously limits our revenue to 50% capacity there. We also didn't have Liberty Fest there, so we saw um, we typically budget that as a break even um, activity anyways. So um, you see the, the loss of revenue there, but we would also see the, lo the, the loss of expenses. We did spend some of those dollars on the fall festival uh, picnic in the park where we had the fireworks and those sorts of things. So some of those expenses were spent this year, but certainly not the full budget. We're looking forward to 22, bringing back a full Liberty Fest um, celebration next year. And we're anticipating as long as the weather cooperates, I think we'll have banner crowds and banner participation. We're really excited for that, but a little overwhelmed at the the volume because we have seen um, all of our outdoor activities since the pandemic have really seen a huge surge in attendance. And I anticipate Liberty Fest will be no exception to that because people will be looking to get out and participate in those community celebrations. So um, big things expected there. Uh, let's see, as far as this budget go, capital improvements. So um, you'll see $10,000 in the 2022 budget. This is to replace the movie screen uh, trailer and projector for our movie screen. We actually do this, uh, we did this for the first time in 2009, and now it's time to replace that. We, we did this with an intergovernmental agreement, so we're not um, paying the full cost for this movie screen and um, projection system and trailer, et cetera, we're gonna split the cost with three other communities, like similar to what we did in 2009. And then each community gets priority dates and we all use, we share the screen back and forth so that nobody has number one, the full cost of purchasing it. And also it uh, alleviates rental fees. And that has been a, a huge savings for us over the years because we were spending close to this much in a single year on rental fees for um, a movie screen for the, the handful of times that we use it throughout the year. So this way um, we're able to own the equipment, get our priority dates, and then as long as nobody else is using it, if we want to add something, we certainly can do that as well. So we're all well cooperate together and it's a fantastic way. So that'll be something that would be coming to the board next year. We'll have to do a um, intergovernmental agreement along with the purchase of this um, screen. Any questions on recreation before I move on? All right, we will jump into Performing Arts Center. Again, this is similar to the sports center housed out of the village theater but also has uh, several programs that are outside of the the facility of the village theater this one uh, again uh, had the challenges with covid we were completely shut down for quite some time um, we did see some significant savings especially on the wages side because uh, uh, I guess timing worked out fortuitously that our village theater coordinator uh, resigned and left for another position. And prior to us filling that position, we shut down due to COVID. So we left that position vacant for quite some time. So we were able to, I guess, take advantage of that unfortunate situation. We certainly felt the loss of Joe, but we have a fantastic new coordinator in Ben that has joined us. We have in 2021, Jeanette worked very well and uh, I guess support it back and forth between um, Jeanette and our finance department to apply very quickly for our shuttered venue grant. There was a very short time frame for that and it was part of the funding was based on how quickly you applied. So finance was fantastic about providing us the reports we need and Jeanette streamlined to get all that in. We received $187,000 for um, loss of revenue for that. And then they came back after our quarter one and two reports from this year and sent us an additional $93,000 uh, for the shutter venue grant. So that's been 
fantastic to really help support our operations. That's, uh, those funds are used for contracted services, utility expenses, and salaries and wages out, out at that facility. Um, so that has been helpful. We do have 22, well, really 21, we saw um, groups that really were itching to get back. We, had, we struggled to find an open date at the theater. Uh, 22 is the same way. We're, we're booked with uh, several, well, with all sorts of rentals. There are very few open dates in 2022 if you wanted to bring a show into the Village Theater. So we'll have some can't produce shows, several rentals, and then our partner shows that will be in there as well. Lots of dance recitals that are going on out there. Um, so that's helped uh, bring some of our revenue back out there. Um, you'll see in 22 and 23, the contributions and donations in here. So in, uh, during the shutdown for COVID, we moved forward with the CIP project for refurbishing the seats that are out at the Village Theater. So new coverings, new cushions, um, the, all the wood being refinished. And the, the plan with the original seat sponsorship was that that would be for the life of the seat. So um, we're gonna look at uh, starting a campaign again, launching early next year to uh, redo our seat sponsorship program in there. So that's the anticipated revenue for that program um, that will launch in 2022. We planned initially to launch that in 2021. Obviously that was not the ideal time to launch a seat sponsorship program. So we deferred that till 2022. And that is the Village Theater. Historic District Commission. So this is really the capital maintenance and repairs of all our historic facilities that are maintained by the township. That includes Cherry Hill School, uh, Sheldon School, the museum out front, Bartlett Travis House, those types of facilities there. So there's really um, not a whole lot of excitement with this budget. Um, but that's what it is all about. And that is, so that concludes all of the general fund items with the historic district commission there. So then this moves on to the uh, 208 fund for the community center here. So with this, um, the biggest challenges for us here are predicting where we're going to head uh, for 22 in terms of revenue for membership revenue um, class participation. Um, we had a lot of discussions with the supervisor, finance director, Trumbull, um, trying to figure out what should we put in here as far as revenue for these different, different items. And where we landed was, let's stick with our original projections for 22, um, evaluate it during the year, and then if we need to, we'll come back and make uh, amendments to both the expenses and revenue because for some of these things if there is not the revenue there then we will not have some of the expenses we may not be able to um, eliminate all of the expenses um, but like for swim lessons for example if we don't have the enough swim instructors like we're in a situation right now that we have more demand than we can handle with our swim instructors all of our classes are full we've got a wait list we don't have enough swim instructors to accommodate that. Um, we make significantly more revenue than we have direct expenses for that um, particular, those swim lessons, but obviously other expenses for those swim lessons are the lifeguards that are on deck, the lights to be on, uh, the significant other expenses that aren't necessarily, um, if you don't have the class, you don't have the expense. Um, so if we reduce the revenue, we, we would be reducing the expenses, but not um, you know, a one-to-one -one ratio for that. So we're gonna um, kind of monitor things on a month-to-month -month and quarterly basis, work with Director Trumbull, um, the supervisor, and uh, make projections and amendments as we go. Same thing for the, um, the um, membership revenue. That's another big piece for us. 
we have we've had seen a significant recovery in our usage as well as membership fees throughout the year if you remember when we started 2021 we were still closed we didn't open i believe until march of this year and when we started off at the beginning of the year we we were seeing about if you compared uh, March of 21 to March of 19 and then April of 21 to April of 19, we were seeing a month to month comparison where we're about 20% of the revenue and 20% of the participation. And we've seen a steady increase throughout the year to where September of this year, we were at about 70% of our participation and 80% of our, of our revenue. Now we ran a special in September that really encouraged people to uh, purchase uh, memberships or renew their memberships. So that helped us boost that revenue number up above our participation number, but we've seen that trickle down a little bit in October. Um, so we're just kind of monitoring that as we go. Um, and we'll see, we see where we kind of end up at the end of the year and then help to monitor that as we progress into 2022 with our participation as well as revenue that we did during the pandemic uh, put everyone's membership on pause and then at the beginning of last year march through um, the end of july we allowed people if you came back in if you had your membership was on pause if you came back in and say may and said okay i'm ready to come back then we restarted your membership if you weren't ready to come back in may we kept your um, membership paused in we told people we would give you a 30 days notice so at the end of june we gave people 30 days notice that okay we're you know we're back to full operations we have a full complement of services vaccines seem to be readily available so people are able to come back into our facilities so at the end of July, we reactivated anyone that was still on a pause. So there are still people who have not hit their renewal um, for uh, purchasing a new membership since pre-pandemic times. If you purchased it, your membership a month before we shut down, um, you still have time left on that initial membership into next year. So we still haven't gotten into that full renewal cycle that we expect to see at a certain point within the pandemic recovery here. So uh, I think I've beat that one to death. If anybody has any questions on that, um, a new cost Craig, that we Craig, have. Yes. Um, sorry, I didn't know if, maybe you were gonna get to this point. You, you didn't talk about um, the indirect cost. There. That was my next okay. thing right there. So okay. the, the okay. new cost that we have here that you'll see is the indirect cost. That was a, that's an accounting change to the way that we're um, accounting for some of the administrative expenses. That was a recommendation from the Rough Tellus Novak report. So that's just a, an accounting change that's calculated by finance. Um, they put that number in, so that kind of changes. That You'll see that both in this budget as well as our golf budget when we move over there. Can, can I interrupt real quick, too? Certainly. I just, I just want to point out as well, the um, subsidy at the bottom um, doesn't really take into account the transfers in and administrative fee lines as part of the revenue. So really the general fund is subsidizing. Greg, I don't know if you can point out that transfers in. General Fund is transferring $2.6 million in to help to help yeah. keep that. And I'm not sure that that makes it clear. It almost looks like it breaks that even was, at the bottom. That, that was going to be my next question okay. was <laughs> that um, big jump there. Well, part of that big jump right. is we've always calculated out what the indirect fees have been for both the golf course and um, the summit and the community center fund. Uh, we've calculated it for the entire township. But because we've historically subsidized the community center and the golf course, we haven't charged it because basically what we'd have to do is charge the expense for the indirect cost and then transfer money in from the general fund to cover their cost. So that's part, you know, the indirect cost or the transfer in that 2.6 is higher by 525,022 because we had to transfer the money to keep them out of a deficit. So it kind of inflates that number a little bit as well. Okay. Thanks. You're welcome. Any other questions on the summit budget? 
What about transfers out? That's different. Yeah. <laughs> I'll let uh, Director Trumbull talk about that one as well. <laughs> that one has to do with appropriately recording the um, expense to the community center fund for the capital as part of the CIP. So the CIP um, in 401, well, it's two, two parts. Um, part of it is to cover the capital that's in 401, so it's almost double counted that, that 259 and that 138,000. Then the other piece of it is to record their portion of the debt that we issued for the capital, for the, for the earlier capital improvements. We transfer that to the debt service fund for them to pay their portion of the debt related to CIP. And if that makes Clear sense to you, maybe you could explain it to me later. <laughs> <laughs> but I trust that Wendy is doing it well, correctly and it all makes sense to her. If you don't understand it, then I should probably explain it again. <laughs> The summit has to pay for that, their debt service. There's principal yeah. and interest payments related to the summit. So that is their portion of the principal and interest on the debt that was issued for the CIP that we issued in 2020. The, that is their it, portion but, of it. Okay, so it's just changing the way we do it because the, has, the, has the summit had debt before? The summit has had debt before. It was paid off. Oh, you can see where the debt service is. It actually was paid off in 2020. Right now, it's not hitting their fund directly. It's hitting the debt service fund because, because that debt was issued across multiple funds, general fund, golf course fund, fire fund. That debt was hit across multiple funds, so that's in its, in its new fund, the debt service fund. So now they have to pay for it. Accounting rules would have this recorded as a transfer out to cover that debt. So is that actually a million dollars, $958,000 of capital improvements to the summit in that year? Or is it just? It's, it's, it's gonna be $259,000 less. So, so $600,000 of that, $700,000 of that is their portion of the debt service because they have the, the roof was a significant. Okay. Um, tile is a significant project in there. HVAC, um, we, so we've got yeah, more roof going on there. So we had the copper roof, we've got uh, the flat roof um, locker room and for 800,000 or so or the flat roof boilers boilers. Boilers. Oh, boilers 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 thank you that was a big sorry I have an ear infection so I'm having a yeah. will that number be of that order of magnitude in the years going out do you think or does it come down at well all? so the debt what the CIP plan was a five year, so it expires in 23, what we have allocated right now. Okay. The debt is a 10 year bond issuance, so, the bond, so they'll be paying $600,000-ish okay. for 10 years. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So the vast majority of the jump from, from these numbers here to this number here in our transfers in covers the, the indirect costs and the transfers out and the capital down here. All right, we'll discuss over a beer sometime. <laughs> that might confuse it more. <laughs> but we can, I think I get it now, so thank you. <laughs> All right, so that is the community center fund, the cable TV fund. So this is all of our franchise and peg fees that come in for our cable TV funds, which you'll see are decreasing. Um, and then our wages and salaries and operating expenses for our cable staff and our cable TV program that are expended out of here, which include will oftentimes um, utilize those funds for improvements in, in this room for new TVs and projection that really helps us with our cable TV broadcast and we're able to use those PEG funds uh, to help offset those expenses. And if I can just, since I have the board's ear right now while you're looking at this, at this fund, as you notice the, um, the fees are going down, the franchise fees are going down significantly. We've talked about that in the past, you know, as the people are doing more streaming, there's no rules for them to have to pay franchise fees to the, to the governments for those, at, at least as of now, that is not part of it. Um, you notice the transfers out that $800,000 that really the majority of the revenue in the cable TV fund is unrestricted. Only the peg fees are considered restricted funds. Um, as those franchise fee revenues go down and the cables wages and fringe benefits continue to be stable, the, the amount we can 
bring into the general fund to help pay for general fund op operations is going to decrease. So that's, this is a revenue source that is likely going to be starting to diminish and we're going to lose where we would have to find other alternate revenue sources unless there's some legislation that comes through on these streaming devices um, that comes through. But uh, looking out into the five-year projections, I, I'm projecting that I think in 24, 25, instead of transferring 800,000, it looks like it's going to be more like $400,000 that we're going to be able to subsidize. So it's a pretty big, it's a pretty big decline. So just something to keep, um, to keep in the back of your mind. Yeah. All right, and then we have our community improvement fund for leisure services. Um, so this is, uh, we're seeing some significant changes, primarily due to the operational changes in moving facility maintenance to the municipal, souls, uh, pardon me, municipal services department. So uh, we had funds in here for uh, repairs to uh, heating and cooling units, repairs to pavement, those sorts of things. So those have been transferred to Director Smith's budget. So we have $50,000 left in here for um, unanticipated property repairs that we may have throughout the parks throughout the year. So those, um, that's pretty much what's left in here. And then last but not least is our golf fund. Um, and I'll, have, I'll break this out um, across mm -hmm. Fellows Creek and Pheasant Run in here as well. Um, but this uh, budget has seen the opposite effect mm -hmm. due to COVID. Um, really, it has really reinvigorated the golf industry as a whole and pushed people, since this was especially during 2020, one of the few activities that you could do, we saw significant increases in participation at both courses. Um, the revenue versus the budget at Pheasant Run looks better than uh, Fellows Creek, just because Fellows Creek, while they saw the same increases in play, um, they have a, a much larger portion of their budget that's dedicated towards banquet operations because they have the banquet facility, mm -hmm. and that was a decline for them that was partially offset by the golf increase, but it doesn't make their actuals to budget look as nice as Pheasant Run, just because Pheasant Run isn't um, as heavy on the banquet side as uh, Fellows Creek is. So uh, when we break this out into uh, Fellows Creek, you'll see the earned income. This is where I was talking about. You see the, the 2020, uh, you do still see a, a bit of a decrease there. That's primarily, like I said, primarily because of the banquet operations. Um, they host a significant number of weddings, family reunions, class reunions, those sorts of things out of that course. They've seen a bounce back this year and they have um, a fair amount of book of uh, events booked for 22 and 23 already out there. Um, so you'll see that we are projecting a, a fairly significant increase here um, because uh, the anticipation is that we will hold on to the majority of that golf increase, um, but also see the banquet revenue bounce back in that facility as well. Um, and then the expenses are stay pretty consistent across the board uh, for this um, budget here. And then in Pheasant Run, this one you'll see uh, 2019 um, at the time was a record year for us and 2020, our greens fees and everything, even with being shut down for a few months at the beginning of the year and then bringing back with carts only and no grill and then eventually going back to uh, full operations. We saw 2020 had a, exceeded that number and uh, 2021 has already blown that number out of the water. We did an increase when we brought the 2021 budget uh, for amendments to the board, we increased um, greens fees, food and beverage, and driving range fees, which are the three primary numbers in there. And we've already exceeded our increased amended budget for each of those line items across the board. So we're doing fantastic out there at Pheasant Run this year, and we're 
uh, projecting those numbers to continue. And, and we really had to, uh, Paul Simpson, our golf manager out there, I really had to um, twist his arm a bit to not project those numbers higher because we don't want to be too aggressive. We know at some point we are going to reach the ceiling. We will, uh, we are, do have fee increases built into all of our budgets really. Um, but, you know, we, he's done a fantastic job of maximizing the leagues out there. We have no opening for leagues um, and, and the golf rounds are just going fantastic. The grill operations have seen a fantastic increase as well. Um, and then uh, this budget, you again see the indirect costs that Director Trumbull was talking about. Uh, and I talked about a little bit on the, and within the summit budget, we have talked about um, in the future, breaking this indirect cost out um, across, allocating a portion of that to uh, Fellows Creek because uh, just this year it was just put in as one lump sum. The majority of it will still be in there for Pheasant Run because we, we have um, HR expenses and payroll and um, uh, accounts payable and those things for Pheasant Run that we don't have for Fellows Creek because that all runs through them. But we do have some of those um, administrative expenses that should be allocated to uh, Fellows Creek as well. So we'll, or we'll look at doing a change so a portion of that um, it's not quite fair that fellows creek doesn't have any of that in there but again it won't be like a, a 50 50 split when we when we do that in the future um, and then the capital improvements here is these are since this is an enterprise fund and, and correct me if i explain this wrong director um, that the cip projects are more direct expense instead of the 401 that we saw down here for like the general fund accounts in there. So that's why, so these are, um, the vast majority of those are CIP projects. We have in 2022, the, the only expense piece of this capital improvement that is a, uh, a new item is uh, $15,000 for a range picker, which I believe Director Trumbull talked about earlier. And then in 2023, $50,000 for a Toro Greens Master mower. And that is it. Any questions on golf or anything across the board at this point? Questions? Oh, anyone online? <clears throat> Any questions online? No? Great. Okay. Very good. Thank you. All right. Thank, Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Yeah, I gotta get that. Thank you so much. All right, we will. Oh, Thank you. 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 Thank Well, thank you for your guys' attention. We'll wrap this up. Hopefully it's not too much information and we still, <laughs> you're still following along here. So really what I want to do is go through and kind of summarize. Sorry, I'm getting foggy and trying <laughs> to stay masked. Um, uh, summarize what you've already heard from all of the um, departments that you've already heard from, heard from the directors. Talk about a couple of the things from IT on the Capitol as well. Go through and do an overall summary of where we are and then see if there's any questions as we're wrapping up. So this is all of the Capitol projects that are non-public safety and for the most part non-CIP related with the exception of the pheasant run uh, that, we, that we discussed. So um, the community improvement, the preventative maintenance, um, that is similar to what we have historically budgeted. That's just for miscellaneous things that break throughout the year and we always um, spend something, something, ha something happens each year. So, some rooftop unit goes down, some roof leaks, you know, from when um, facilities maintenance was under um, Director Hohenberger, he can account for it. Like we had to add something to the budget because things were happening. We're not quite sure what was gonna happen, but we knew something was going to, so we had it. 
um, set aside for that. Uh, for Fellows Creek, there's some um, banquet room partitions and some internal doors throughout that needed um, fixing. There's a water heater at the fleet um, under the land improvements. For, there's preventative maintenance. That's what um, Dr. Holmberger just had spoken about. That's his, that has always been in the budget. It just hasn't been necessarily broken out separately um, in the past. Pheasant Run, all of those, the cart pass, the east parking lot and the west parking lot, those are actually in the CIP, but because they're not in the CIP fund, they got broken out separately in here. Um, for the computers and equipment for the clerk's department, uh, there's uh, the clerks put in $2,000 for some computers, CLS admin, some computer equipment and the inspection tablets that Director Hohenberger spoke about, a couple laptops for the engineering department were added. And then for the IT department, um, and I can touch on those a little bit more, and of course when there's a new ITI director, some of these things might change, you know, based on some of the direction that that um, new individual will bring to the table. Right now, our replacement desktops and laptops, these are on a rotating four-year cycle, so this is just the computers that will be up at, at that four-year span. So it's a big year for us. Um, in 2019, we purchased a bunch and now four years later here's where the here's where that lands for the most part we're replacing most desktops with laptops uh, with the exception of com shared computers you know at DPW there's shared computers between some of the um, AFSCME employees because they don't you really use the computers they come into punch in punch out but they have them accessible to them same thing in the in the police records room where the officers might go in to write some reports they don't have their own laptops they have some shared desktops so for the most part we're getting all employees laptops to allow for remote working where possible um rico back in the past all of our copiers had been kind of individually budgeted in the separate departments and then you'd have some departments who weren't replacing it for 10 years some for five years and we decided that they really should be in the it department and have a routine maintenance schedule so those are just Recos as they're expiring and the old ones get replaced. Um, so then we've got some server extended support, which is probably, that gets, uh, it's, it's in the capital because it is a one-time expense, but it's over a few years that has to get depreciated. Probably shouldn't be necessarily in the capital. Um, but then we also have some, a server upgrade and some, some hardware upgrade that um, our IT manager had indicated it would be at the end of its lifespan. However, to the extent that we move, potentially move some of our stuff to the cloud, that server might not need to be quite as robust as, as it's currently being replaced to be. So it depends on what direction we head with the IT director, but it's in here for now. And I would anticipate there would be some changes once the new IT director comes in and has, has some thoughts on that as well. And then um, MSD also put in some, some computer, MSD admin computer equipment. And then the remaining um, non-public safety capital projects and non-water and sewer as well, uh, under the machinery and equipment, we have some election equipment, some uh, utility cart that Dr. Hohenberger just spoke about, the Greens Master, and the equipment lease for the summit. Um, that also, they replace their equipment every few years, so they're always replacing some of it each year, so there's always some new equipment and it's not a big year purchase, kind of almost like the computer replacement, they're replacing things every few years. They're using something every year, but about this amount every year. Um, so then we had some ADA improvements at Pheasant Run, replacement van for the cable, and then an inspector truck for engineering. So the total non-public safety capital is $2.2 million in the budget. I put a slide up here for the public safety. I just, I, as um, Director Baugh and Stockline were going through their budgets, I verified these numbers all agreed, so all is well in the world, so I won't spend any time on this slide. And I wanted to show, here's what the debt schedule is for um, the current debt that we have. Um, so you can see from the um, 23 and 24, if you look at the very top, how do you, there it is, okay. Right here, these two, in 23, this is our outstanding debt, or debt payment. You can see for the non-public safety, We've got $4.1 million, and then 24 it drops to $1.8 million. We have one of our large debt, outstanding debt obligations that we'll have our last payment in 23. So that drops off about a $2 million, a little over $2 million a year. So you can see um, every year, so in 23 we're paying a total township wide of 7.8, it drops to 4.2. It stays pretty constant at 4.2 for a few years. 
then it drops down um, once the water and sewer bond has been paid off for the for the tower then we're down to 1.6 million dollars a year and that's um, that is going to be the bond we just issued for the CIP so now is the big daddy <laughs> big um, a lot of numbers that we cover and I'm not going to go over all of these the one I really want to focus on right now is because everybody's talked about their own individual funds I want to really focus on the general fund overall because we've talked everybody a lot of people have a piece of the general fund revenue the proposed revenue in the budget for general fund in 22 is 31.5 million and in 23 we've got 32.1 million so that's an increase of about six hundred thousand dollars we're estimating the property taxes to be up almost four hundred thousand dollars and then the um, sidewalk replacement revenue is up about hundred and twenty thousand dollars just because of the sidewalk program expanding mm -hmm. um, and the timing of when we collect those payments for the residents who have to pay for their sidewalks so people when they pay for their sidewalks they have if they have a significant amount of sidewalks some people opt to not pay it and to have it roll over to their taxes so then that varies on our revenue and when we collect the revenue so that's a portion of that and then we also have the state shared revenue up $160,000, that 2% increase. We did double check about the inflation factors for property taxes. The state has not released that yet. Last year, the letter was dated October 20th. So it just hasn't come out yet. I, would, I expect it any day. So we'll let you know um, as soon as we get any information on that. I want to then skip down to the fire fund. Fire fund was at $17.9 million in 22, and we're expecting it to be 18.7 in 23. Uh, so up about $700,000. Property taxes make up almost 100% of that. That's about 700,000. And then the ambulance revenue is actually also up $100,000 for where they're expecting that to be. So that accounts for that. And the police fund, um, which we didn't talk about is uh, 24.9 million in 22 and 25.9 million in 23. So that's up about a million dollars and that's 100% related to the property tax revenue. Going down the line, there's not um, a lot of significant. I will touch on the DDA. Um, the township board adopts the DDA's budget, but the DDA actually um, adopts it. We don't really micromanage what the DDA's budget is, but it is required to be part of the township's budget. Um, we spoke with DDA, and as, if you recall, the general fund has been contributing about $400,000 to the DDA once some of their revenue had gone down. The general fund was subsidizing a portion of the, as, if you recall, the special assessments had been going to the DDA and no longer can that go there. So they lost about a million dollars worth of revenue. Then the general fund was giving them $400,000 back. They um, said they are comfortable that they can balance their budget without needing that additional $400,000 from the general fund. So their revenue is going down $400,000 as a result of that, and our expenses are decreasing by $400,000 in the general fund because we will not be subsidizing them in 23 for that amount of money. Um, but going down the list, there's really nothing other big significant jumps or significant changes in the revenue side of things. Looking at the trend of the expenditures for the last six years, you can see that really the trend between the major classifications are pretty pretty constant. The general fund's the bottom blue. Uh, you know, it was 23% in 2018, 21% in 1919, 19, 19, 22, 22. It's pretty fluctuated. It's been pretty consistent of the overall township's budget. It's pretty consistent to where it's been. Uh, public safety is also pretty consistent, 27%, 32, 32, 27, 29, 28. All these fluctuations are pretty much in the ballpark. So if you look at the overall townships, townships budget, there hasn't been a lot of changes in the makeup of the overall funds spent um, over the last six years. This is a pie chart. I included it in here. I'm not going to spend time on it. It's another way to just look at it. I know sometimes people like looking things in, you know, stacks. Some people look at it in pie chart, so I included it. Um, the one I really want to talk about here is the overall change in expenditures. Um, instead of looking at the revenue one, instead of looking at, instead of looking at this, we're going to look at this. <laughs> it's a little bit easier to look at that way. Mm -hmm. um, so the general fund expenditures overall increased by about $554,000 from 22 to 23. 
uh, make, it's made up of a few things. So the salaries, wages, and fringes overall uh, increased about $849,000. Um, so increased by more than what the overall expenses increased. So the, the salaries, wages, and fringes were $849,000. That was made up of um, the medical and prescriptions of about 426,000, salaries of 320, and pension of 100. Um, but as I just spoke about, if you recall that $400,000 transfer to the DDA that is not happening, that decreased it uh, a little bit. So that offset that. Uh, there was some capital alley that we talked about uh, went up by about $300,000, but then the transfers out decreased by 300,000. So there's some ups and downs in various categories, but overall it's about a half a million dollar increase in the general fund. Uh, the roads fund increased by $300,000. That's as a result of being able to do extra road work because of the increase in property taxes that we'll be collecting. Fire fund expense is going down 1.4 million. Um, that is uh, as a result of the capital going down, the um, $900,000 um, that we had for the fire apparatus that is getting budgeted for in 22. Um, and it, it's 100% because of the capital. The capital is going down $1.9 million from where it was in 22. Their salaries actually went up about half a million dollars. Police fund expenses are going up $850,000, mainly due to salaries, wages, and fringes of $700,000. They have more capital of about $76,000, and then they have some debt service of $82,000. Uh, community center and golf is combined on here, just so it was all on one, on one um, line item so we could put this on one slide. So that increased by $114,000. Um, the golf capital increased um, by $244,000. Um, and then the summit capital actually decreased $220,000. So those two offset each other. But the main difference is because of the um, salaries and wages for golf increasing. Um, by about $68,000. The uh, community improvement in capital represents the capital fund and the summit fund. That decreased by a million dollars, and that's really just a matter of the planned CIP for 23 was down a million dollars from where it was in 22 from the board approved capital improvement plan. Water and sewer fund went up slightly by $200,000. Garbage and rubbish, as um, Director Smith had indicated, we have a 3% increase in our contract with the garbage hauler. So that's a $240,000 increase. And then the remaining uh, funds is about a um, $57,000 decrease in their overall expenses. And again, that includes the DDA, um, cable funds, street lighting, 911. There's a, there's a number of funds that go into that. So that, that was kind of a summary of this. <laughs> <laughs> that I, just so we're not going through individual line items there, I thought that would be a little easier to cover. But this is the big one. So based on what we all, what we talked about earlier, based on where we're, where we took the actual fund balance for 2020, where we know the fund balance ended for 2020, what is budgeted for 2021, which we know will finish better, but it's still what we budgeted for, and that's how we have to adopt our budgets in accordance with state law. And then what we're going to ask the board to approve in the budget for 22, that's how we're going to come up with our 22 proposed fund balance. What we actually had, what was in the budget for 2021, and what we're asking the board to approve for 2022. That's where our fund balance would start, right here, for each of these funds. For this, like for the general fund, it would start at the $16 million. With what we're asking the board to, well, consider, obviously in two weeks, we're not asking the board to adopt this budget. This is what we're presenting. Um, it would be a general fund would be using fund balance of $3.2 million. So the fund balance at the end of the year would be $13 million. Still a very healthy fund balance for the general fund. Uh, same thing for all of these funds. All the funds would end up in a positive um, fund balance at the end of the year. Fire fund would have a $5.4 million fund balance. Police would be $6.6 .6 million. So very healthy fund balances, still t about 25, 20 to 25% of the overall fund balance for, for those funds. And again, I say that's very um, conservative because here's over the last five years where we have budgeted to use a fund balance. So here's the general fund use of fund balance. We average, you know, two to three million dollars use of fund balance if you look at the last five years. And what we've actually 
transferred or used a fund balance is over here. So the difference between what we have actually budgeted to use a fund balance and what we have have used a fund balance is significantly different. So this is always the, this has historically been the worst case scenario, but we do have to budget with where we think the potential is. We have to ask the board for what we are, you know, what you are comfortable with the department spending based on the salaries. We know we budget salaries based on the people we have today. There's always going to be some turnover and positions open for a little bit. Um, and when we're budgeting out two years, we're making an estimation of where medical costs are. Um, we're self-insured, so you know, we, we use the best we can from our outside consultants, but you know, I, they also give us some conservative numbers. So, so we know that um, based on the budget, we are asking the board to consider for 23 as a starting point. We're very comfortable that we're in a good position that our fund balance will be fine at the end of 2023. And with that, I am happy to answer any questions. No, online? I, I will add that um, Trustee Ganguly had asked um, if, I, if we could have a conversation about defining really what the different funds mean. I know for some of the trustees, there's a lot of funds and it's hard to understand what they mean. We are working on, and we've already started to put together, and we have a, we have a draft of it, of a fund description for every single fund on what the purpose of it is, what, the, you know, what we're spending it on. That will be incorporated into the budget documentation. And once I have a chance to actually complete a review of that, I will send that out to the board um, so you guys have that. For your for your documentation as well and then if there's questions on that i'm happy to meet with anybody on that but i know that would be helpful for you you know just to understand what the different funds mean and some of them are obvious some of them are not as obvious so we'll, so we'll get that out to the to the trustees okay great as we're in a study session any audience questions do you have any questions on the budgets no Oh, does that work? I didn't know if the podium was still working or... George Miller. A lot of things I don't understand on this. I'm, it caught my eye was, was mentioned. Why do we have to have a copper roof on the summit possibly or one of the community centers? The price of a copper roof is very, very expensive over uh, possibly another roof. Next thing is, I'd like to know a little bit about Fellows Creek, or the, the pro that is leasing that or is running it now. We're not supporting that in any shape or form. They're supposed to meet a certain quota, whatever it is, regardless every year. And are they meeting that quota? We're not supporting them in the general fund, are we? So what is a Fellows Creek contract? Um... That's just basically What's how it runs. Contract? I'm underneath that impression. Okay, so they, the way the contract works is that they uh, they receive so all the revenues and expenses flow through the township, and then they receive a monthly management fee for operating the course, and then if they don't meet their um, uh, budget that was proposed during the RFP and the contract time, then they uh, forfeit a portion of their management fees. And then if they exceed it, exceed their budget by a certain level, then they would qualify for a potential um, bonus on those for that. All right. Okay. The DPW fund, I've asked questions on that. There was an excavator bought last years ago, a used one. I like those answered. Okay, do you have any questions on the budgets that we proposed that we've yeah, shown you? This is part of the budget. Okay. Uh, this, this is the deep, excuse me. The three minutes, allow, allow me that. That's part of the budget. How much was spent on the excavator? And why was another excavator bought? How can you be accountable for that? Like I ask, when it reaches 26 foot and the sewers that you're servicing is only 10 foot deep, what's, what's the cause of buying that? What's the use that justifies buying that excavator? 
even the first one, 10 years ago or more, and even the second one. Thanks, George. Do you have any other comments? That's it. Thank you. Any other comments online? No? Okay, great. Any board comments? Thorough as always and very understandable. Um, and m for the most part, good news. So I'm glad to see it. Thanks, Kate. Um, yeah, just wanted to echo what Stephen said. Um, thank you for all the hard work on this. Um, and thank you to all the departments for their presentations. I think you all did a great job of presenting things and um, a good synopsis of of what's going on and um, made it easy for for us to, to follow along. Um, we have, of course, more in-depth documents that we're going through, but um, appreciate these presentations tonight. So thank you. Thank you, Diane. Do you have anything? Yep. I just want to echo as well. Uh, good job, really great presentations from everybody. And I know you worked very hard to uh, get this, so we do appreciate all your hard work. Um, so thank you all so much. Thank you, Tanya. Anything? Uh, yeah, I just want to echo everybody's um, thoughts here on presentations, and specifically Director Trumbull. She's always so prompt in replying or um, answering my questions. And uh, I really, I would say that graphs help better in understanding than the numbers. It was, it was very um, easy to understand uh, what we are doing in the future budgets, and it was very thorough. And really thank everyone for doing this, and I'm uh, looking forward to the amended budget uh, with the board goals in January. Thanks, Tanya Summer. I will echo what everyone else has said, um, and I know usually the team does a great job of getting us the materials in advance, but I especially appreciated um, being able to look over everything um, in advance of the meeting. So. Thank you for your great presentations tonight. Thank you, Michael. Uh, yeah, thank you everybody. This um, two and a half hour meeting has been very insightful and lots of detail, um, a lot to digest, obviously. I've had the benefit of going through five of these budgets mm -hmm. and through the multi-year process I also have the benefit of having to submit my own budgets as well. So I know how to do it from both ends. Um, I'm excited about the process we'll be using over the next couple of months in determining how we're going to fund and prioritize kind of board goals on top of the baseline um, operating budgets of the township themselves. There's definitely some things in the 2023 budget that are a little concerning for me. Um, I was glad to hear that the quarter million dollars for the um, for this SAN um, uh, network um, was going to be, or server was going to be um, potentially pared down a little bit. I um, would love to see us migrate more towards a cloud solution as we kind of advance towards Towards the future, and that was a that's a big it's a big investment in physical infrastructure from a technology standpoint. So I was a little concerned about that, but would love to have, see what the IT manager or ITI director uh, kind of adds to that conversation as they come in. Um, you know, um, but yeah, on top of that, um, you know, George brought up the the copper roof at the summit. I was very much opposed in the beginning to the copper roof. I thought it was excessive and extremely expensive. Um, and it turns out that I was wrong when we factored in the length of the, of the life of that roof and compared it to the length of the life of the cheaper roof. It actually turned out that the dollars you would be spending over the depreciable life of the roof itself was cheaper if you went with the copper roof. And that's why I was converted to become a gung-ho copper roof supporter. Um, it was counterintuitive, um, but it was, it was good information. Um, you know, I had also, you know, I, I do believe that Madam Supervisor, you have provided the information on the excavator. I know there was an RBA 
for that decision that was made a couple of weeks ago at a board meeting. There was a lot of information about the fact that the, the one excavator had been purchased right around the time I was born and it is well past its depreciable life um, and that we traded it in and got some credit for trading it in to get the new excavator. And so if you have provided that information to the resident um, who routinely asks about that, can you, you know, just maybe make sure that they get a second copy of that information uh, before the next meeting? While I do appreciate hearing about it, um, it would be helpful to just, you know, make sure they get that information maybe one more time. Um, other than that, you know, the budget process here is pretty thorough, multi-year. That's very, makes me feel safe. Um, that million dollar transfer to OPEB, I, I mean, at some point I'd like to maybe meet with the actuaries and do a, and try to maybe see when we're going to be fully funded and see if, if the board wants to keep making that ancillary or that extra million dollar deposit into OPEB, uh, or if at some point we might want to pare that down to fund other things too. Um, I'm not suggesting we do that. What I am suggesting is some maybe a dive into that over the next year before we approve the 2023 budget might be beneficial to determine what we want to do from a long-term uh, funding you know, strategy. Do we want to keep aggressively paying down these uh, pension obligations? I know we, we kind of created that million dollar policy. Um, previous boards did, I think. And um, that was at a time when we had um, tens of millions of dollars of unfunded pension and OPEP liabilities um, that were, we were feeling kind of really uncertain and crushed by the weight of. And maybe it makes sense financially to keep doing that. Maybe it doesn't. But that's something I think that would be really helpful to kind of wrap our arms around as we finish out and, and we deliver the 2022 budget that was approved. And we look, or wait, we set the tax rate. We deliver the 2022 budget if it's approved and then um, get ready to, to look at the 2023 budget. Other than that, great work, ma'am, supervisor, great work team. Good work to uh, young great work board of trustees. Thank you, yes, you're correct. We have provided the resident with the RBA with the particular piece of equipment he's speaking of and we will do it, we will send it again. Um, I just wanted to make a couple comments. Thank you very much. I know the teams did a, a great job. They've really um, worked hard on this for many weeks. And thank you to our finance group. I know you've worked, you've had your nose to the grindstone. So thank you, oh, both of you, Wendy, Carolyn, thank you very much. You guys did a great job. A couple of things on the 911 funds. I did hear mention of the legislation coming through. So hopefully they're gonna start being um, charging cell phones. So hopefully that fund will start going up again. I know it's been decreasing as people moved away from landlines, but we might start seeing an increase soon if that legislation goes through. I think they think it's fav favorable to pass. So hopefully that'll pass soon. But I also wanna say, I mean, as you noticed through all the budgets that we looked at, COVID had a large impact on all of our funds, as you can see, and we still, it's still an unknown. We still don't know if it's, if, when it's over. I had sent the board and some of the directors some economic predictions from um, Wayne County, University of Michigan, and SEMCOG, and they predict that the struggles of our lower end wage scale part-time jobs will still continue into next year. So that's, you know, where that affects our budget yet, we, we still don't know. So the labor shortages and experienced across nations, you know, as well as industries, you know, it impacts our departments and we know that. And I think the groups have done a great job in trying to um, balance that. You know, it's, a, it's, it's very unpredictable. And, we, you know, we're all moving through it in a great way. Um, so we continue also, as you could see, to look for grants and partnerships to help us increase and sustain the services to our residents. And the residents are enjoying that. So while we're, we're balancing COVID and what's happening. I think the groups are doing a great job and um, you know, providing the services to the residents and doing what we can to help them. So good job, everybody. No, not everybody's here. We'll have, a, we'll have everybody sit down and watch this, this tape again. <laughs> All right, great. Any other comments? I have one comment because I'm very remiss to not thank Carolyn Cox, the budget yeah. manager. And I know she's very uncomfortable. She doesn't like that, but she really stepped up. This is a really tough budget year for some reason. She's been working on the budget since June. So it's, um, I, I really appreciate everything she's done for the budget. She stepped up and has helped um, do more of the reviews for me that I've, I've done in the past. So I appreciate it and thank you for the hard work. Good job. I know if those of you who can't see, they're both pointing at each other saying, no, it was her, it was her. <laughs>
Yes. Great team. Good job. So can I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Oh, thank you. It was moved by um, Stephen and Diane and Michael, and they all supported it also. Okay, great. So <laughs> the meeting adjourns at 8.31 p.m. on November 2nd. Have a great night.